stroll down the streets of the beautiful city of Dublin. Listen to what the preacher and the pigeons have to say to each other on St. Stephen's Green. Or watching the big fat fish mulleting about in the grimy and the slimy shallows of the River Liffey. You wouldn't be wasting your time, to my way of thinking. But if you began reading the destinations on the buses, you'd at last see one for Chapel Izod. And there's not many know, there's a story in that, because there's not many know that that's named after Isold. Chapel Izod is named after Isold, Isold of the White Throat, who so long ago was the daughter of the King of Dublin. And whether this daughter of the King of Dublin, whether it was the daughter of Ragnar, Harry Breeks, or Siegfried Silkbeard, it was one of these Viking kings of Dublin that they had in those days, and uh, she was to marry, this beautiful woman, she was to be married to Mach at Merchian, the King of Cornwall. And Arthur, King Arthur, the High King of all the Britons, whose name is better than meat to anyone who will recite his praises, Arthur had sent his own kinsman, he had sent his own cousin, Tristan, over the sea to Dublin to fetch this beautiful woman to her wedding. Now, it was a quiet, hot and sultry day. The ship pulled out from Dublin Harbour. The sea was like a mill pond. The sails hung limp and the rowers had the oars out and were pulling on them. <laughs> Cursing the weather <laughs> profusely and quietly. Tristan and Isolde sat in the bow of the boat where they'd get any breath of air that might be drifting past and they played chess together. Or was it drafts? <laughs> at all events, Isolde won every game. So Tristan, <coughs> at a loss for anything particular to say to this beautiful woman, he thought he would play the harp to her. Finally, he couldn't think of any other way to entertain her, so he sent the servant boy down to below to get something to drink. <coughs> but it was not the bottle <coughs> of fine peppermint flavoured old Australian fighting burgundy with which he returned. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it was something far, far better than that. It was a small bottle of love potion <laughs> that was made by his old father's chief druid be drunk between her and Marchat Merchian the day of their wedding. Well, they had a couple of half jills of that. <laughs> they stared at each other, horror-stricken, passionately in love forever. And Tristan, being a man of obsessive honour, insisted on delivering the beautiful woman to the gates of Marchat Merchian's castle, as he had sworn to do. And then he stalked off to assuage his grief in nightly deeds, and in daily deeds as well. <laughs> While Assault lay staring anorexically at the wall. <laughs> Till finally this life of servants, misspelled messages and midnight assignations proved unbearable in the days before the text. And they eloped together. They ran away to a forest, the forest of Caledon, that cloaked old Scotland from Carlisle in the west all the way to Newcastle in the east, the wildest and deepest woods in all the lands of Arthur. Now messengers came to Arthur from the enraged king, Mark at Merchion, demanding some justice. And Arthur thought long and carefully with his wisest advisers. For Tristan, 
like many a warrior of these days, was also a harper, as we have seen. <laughs> but like many a harper of these days, he was also just a wee bit of a wizard. <laughs> and he had these powers. For if he would put a wound on any man, even the tiniest scratch, that man would die. But if any man would wound him, huh, even the tiniest scratch, that man would die. <laughs> so he was not the kind of person who could be brought out of Caledon Forest easily. <laughs> so Arthur hit on a wonderful plan. <coughs> He gathered together a specially highly trained guerrilla squad <laughs> of poets and harpers. For these, Tristan would never harm, for he was hoping to have his book reviewed by one of them. <laughs> and they presented Arthur's case in such a beautiful way that Tristan and Isolde came out of the forest and they agreed to abide by the judgment of the great king. Now, here is what the great king Arthur <coughs> decreed. Now, you say this after with me. Say this after with <coughs> me. Uh, uh, the judgment of the great king. Isolde, Isolde must spend one part of the year with one man. When the trees are in leaf. And one part of the year with the other. The when the trees are bare. Then the a salt laughed and she clapped her hand and she said, Blessed be the <laughs> tongue that gave that judgment. Blessed be the lips that uttered it. And blessed be the pen that recorded it. Three trees there are. Loyal and true. The holly, the ivy, and the yew that keep their leaves all year through. And so Tristan was married to his soul. And so the real story ends before Wagner got his hands on it. <laughs> Some say that Chapel Izod is where she was buried. Years and years later in, in Dublin, there's a little wooden church that was built over by a little early medieval church that was built over by a, a medieval perpendicular Gothic church that was built over by a Victorian Gothic monstrosity that was, at all events, it's under a building site now. <laughs> And last year I was down in Cornwall doing a, a literature festival in a little town called Foy. And um, passing alongside of the road there, there was a tall stone beside the road, a big standing stone. And they found it in a field lying down five or six years ago. And when they lifted it up, they found on the underside of that stone the one word in the old writing. Tristan. So maybe that's where Tristan is buried. But if it is, whatever became of his wonderful music, no one knows.